All right, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is lesson number four. The title of this lesson, A Time for Everything. And uh, I'm going to break this up into two sections. So this will be part one of that. And uh, if you're following along in your own Bibles, it'll be Ecclesiastes chapter three, uh, verses one to 11. So we've said that uh, in this uh, book, Ecclesiastes, Solomon uh, documents his search for meaning in uh, different uh, lifestyles, different modes of thinking about life. And basically thus far he has examined life from various perspectives. Just review these for a moment. Um, he's um, uh, reviewed life from the, um, from the perspective of pursuing um, sensual pleasure. And uh, his conclusion uh, is that uh, it's all enjoyable. I mean, you know, sensual pleasure is, is wonderful, but it's not profitable. You can't, you can't build on it. Then he examined the life lived wisely or foolishly. And uh, his conclusion there was that both of these uh, lifestyles, wise and foolish, both of them end in death. And therefore, in the end, one really isn't much better than the other because they both end up exactly the same way. And then the pursuit of meaning through one's activity here on earth. And he concludes several insights about man's work life. One is that uh, inward joy and satisfaction is a, actually a gift from God and cannot be produced simply from succeeding at one's work. In other words, the ability to enjoy what you have, the ability to enjoy your work and gain satisfaction from it, that ability is, is something that God gives you, not your work. He also says that when one is right with God, that person can derive profit not only from his own work, but also from everyone else's work. The idea, the idea being you either are able to appreciate someone else's work rather than envying that person's work or trying to capitalize and build profit from someone else's labor rather than manipulate or exploit them. So you know, if you're, in other words, if you're satisfied with your life and with your work uh, because, God has, uh, because you have a relationship with God and He has enabled you to enjoy uh, your life and to be content, you can also be happy for somebody else. You can also rejoice when someone else succeeds. Even if someone else succeeds beyond your own success, you can still be happy for them if you already uh, are able to find contentment in life. And also uh, Solomon, or rather Solomon now, explores the context in which a person's life and work is carried out, and that is the framework of time itself. Remember we said uh, he's going to look at work in the framework of time. So first he looked at work and drew the conclusions that uh, I've just mentioned. Now he's going to examine time. That famous passage, there's a time for everything. This is what we're going to look at here. Now before we study the text uh, about time, we need to perhaps uh, get a few definitions about time itself, what it is, what is time, a definition, a measurable period during which events occur. I mean, it's not the only definition, but we can work with that definition. What is time? Time is a measurable period during which events occur. Uh, why is time so important? Well, it's not important in itself, but it measures events which are irretrievable once they pass. You know, we say you can't stop time. What do we mean by you can't stop time? Well, the things that happened have happened and they've gone by. You can't go back and get them. And also, Time is a reminder of the passing and movement of life. Time and life, we see our life passing by with all the events. Hopefully we're marking it with some of the happy marking points in life, you know, your 21st birthday, or you know, when, you, you, when you get out of the military, your first job, uh, getting married, having your first child, you know, those type of things, buying your first home. All of these are marker points in life, supposedly giving us some joy, but at the same time reminding us that time is going by. We, we just can't go back and get those things any, anymore. Uh, when did time begin and when does it end? Well, concrete events 
concrete events and changes began with creation and thus did time. What does the Bible say? In the beginning. What is in, what is in brackets there that isn't mentioned? Well, in the beginning of time. In the beginning means that's when time begins. Genesis 1.1. And time will end when what time measures and the instruments by which time is determined, plan, uh, planets, stars, when these things cease to be, at Jesus' return, then so will time end. And so Solomon examines the context in which a person's life is lived out time and the events that take place throughout the time that a person spends here on earth. And he concludes that the events, the times, in one's life are cyclical in nature and like nature itself, when examined, are in themselves pointless. You know, I've told you before, this is not, the first part of this book, not a happy book. <laughs> I mean, you almost want to despair. You know, you're in despair already. He's, he's looked at work and he said, oh, it all comes to nothing, it's pointless. No matter what you, no matter what you build, you know, you're going to die. And after you die, some fool will get your, your, everything you've worked hard to build, some fool will get it and just waste it. You know, oh, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> so we begin in chapter three, verse one. And he says, there is an appointed time for everything and there is a time for every event under heaven. So the reference to time and its cyclical nature is alluded to right here in the very first verse. And in the following verses he's going to refer to 14 pairs of opposite events which occur at appointed times. Now the fact that they are mentioned in multiples of seven and that they begin with birth and death um, is significant. In other words, the way, that, the way that the passage is laid out is significant. Opposites suggest the entire gamut of experience. So when he mentions opposites, you know, the time to be born, the time to die, he's he, what he's saying, and everything in between that I have not mentioned. All right, that's the, significant of the significance of the uh, opposite. It's a poetic device called merism. The number seven suggests completeness. Now the Jews had assigned a certain meaning to certain numbers. For example, the number three was a reference to God. Number four, the world or the creation, you know, north, south, east, west, you know, four corners. Uh, the number seven, uh, God and His creation together. Okay, the sum of everything. Number seven. And number 10 also uh, referred to something that was mature, something that was complete, something that was ripe. 10. We have 10 commandments, for example. 10. And the number 1,000, the number 1,000 uh, meant something was fully matured, something, you know, you could not add anything to it, something God Himself only. Uh, knows. You know, we have the thousand year reign, you know, we talked about it in Revelation. Ten times ten times ten is a thousand. So that's, you know, it's not just mature, ten, it's ten times ten times ten. It's fully mature, the full time. Okay? So even though he doesn't mention every conceivable event in life, the things he does mention and the way that he arranges them is meant to convey the idea of the total of life and the total experiences of life. So each time, he says, has its significance and teaches important lessons, but the sum total of these do not constitute the whole meaning of life. There's the point he makes. So he refers to everything that happens in life symbolically in the way he lays everything out. Okay, two sets of seven, everything from beginning to end. And his point is, even though I've mentioned everything here, all of this together still does not equal and still does not teach us what life is all about. 
So let's go through them and let's see his conclusion. So he begins, he says, uh, there's a time to give birth and a time to die. So the beginning and the end of life, the common experience of everyone, and the experience that reduces everyone to a common denomination, uh, de uh, denominator. Kings and paupers, they both are born and they both die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. So a time of renewal and a time of change refers not only to the growing seasons of the farmer and the cycle of preparing, planting and harvest, but also to those seasons of our own lives when we are in stages of growth and development and learning, perhaps rethinking old ideas. A time to kill, he says, and a time to heal. Destruction, restoration. Now in that day and time, a family could avenge the death of one of their own. And so they had cities of refuge. We read about that in Numbers 35, verse six. So if someone accidentally killed someone, accidentally, uh, there were no police forces, uh, you know, there were no cops to call. That person who had you know, accidentally killed somebody could uh, go to one of these cities of refuge and take refuge there because it was legal, it was permitted that someone in the family of the deceased could avenge that family of that person's death. But if the person who had committed the either crime or the accident was in a city of refuge, then the elders or the leaders of that city would have a, a trial, if you wish, a hearing to, to hear all the facts and uh, you know, uh, render some sort of uh, decision. And so there was a time for this kind of justice, he says. And then at other times, restoration and healing was the order of the day. A good example of this um, is uh, Mephibosheth, uh, a character in the Old Testament. He was Saul's grandson. Saul, the first uh, king of uh, Israel, had a grandson. And this, son was, this grandson was crippled in both of his feet. Um, and he was Jonathan's son. Uh, and Jonathan and David uh, were friends, good friends. And uh, David had promised Jonathan that he would protect uh, his child. And so David, because of his love towards uh, Jonathan, spared the life of this man and supported him uh, because of his oath to Jonathan. So there was a time for war, David, uh, uh, was at war for many, many years. Uh, he was in conflict with Saul for many, many years. So there was a time for destruction, but then there was a time for renewal. There was a time for restoration. And, and so uh, Mephibosheth uh, received uh, uh, mercy uh, and, um, and care from the hand of, of David. Sometimes we're at war, destruction, sometimes restoration. Um, a time to tear down and a time to build up, demolish and rebuild. Urban renewal, the cycle of rebuilding, remodelizing, modernizing. Isn't it strange, you go into a city, well, even Oklahoma City, when I first came here many years ago, you drive downtown, there was this like, oh my goodness, ab abandoned warehouses and, you know, there was not much going on here. And you figure, boy, this is terrible. No, nobody would want to be down here. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the city gets a plan. And all of a sudden, all those abandoned warehouses uh, <laughs> are very, they change the name. They're no longer abandoned warehouses, they're lofts. <laughs> we now call them lofts <laughs> at $2,500 a month for rent. And there's something really nice about maintaining that old scratched up floor where all the machines were and the, the, you know, the chipped uh, brick. And oh, no, no, leave, leave, leave the columns in the ceiling. No, no, that, that adds, oh, tin up in the ceiling? Sure, oh no, leave that there. Yeah, that's part of the charm, isn't it? So there's a, you know, there's a time to demolish stuff. There's a time to rebuild. There's a time to you know, restore these uh, type of, these type of things. Um, he says a time to weep and a time to laugh, sorrow and joy. Life is a continuous cycle of events to create one or the other. 
Things are happening to us in our life that make us laugh or cry. Many times we make ourselves miserable because we try to avoid sorrow or we see it as an aberration in life and thus learn nothing. But Solomon says that it's a natural part of life. It has its time. Sorrow has its time. And we've learned that recently, you know, in the last hundred years or so, research psychologists tell us, you know, grieving, that's an important part of the, the process of loss, is grieving. You have to go through it. I mean, the rule about grieving is you can't, you can't, you know, you can put it off. You can put it off, all right, but you're going to have to go through it sometime or other. You may have lost someone you loved, you know, 15 years ago, and if there was no grieving process then, 15 years later, 20 years later, you're going to go through it somehow because it will have its time. Sorrow will have its time. No use being angry. Oh, it's up fair, you know, shaking your fist to the heavens. It's so unfair. It's wasting my life. Every day I spend in sorrow means that you know, my life is being wasted because my life, you know, <laughs> this idea that everyone deserves to be happy all the time. Really, who made that rule? Because life certainly doesn't work like that. Solomon in his wisdom says, hey, there's, there's a time for joy. I mean, you know, drink your fill of it. But there's also a time for sorrow. Don't see that as some sort of cosmic mistake. There's a time to mourn, time to dance. Again, the cycle of various passages in life, or rather that life takes us through birth and death and marriage and divorce and success and failure, you know, ups and downs of life. There's a time for these things. And it's so comforting when we understand that. Comforting in the sense that when we're in the moments of joy, it helps us to truly absorb the joy and just live it and partake in it because we understand that it only has a time and not to waste it. And if we understand that times of sorrow, they also come and it's a natural part of life, we're, we're not so afraid all the time because we understand, well, you know, I'm enjoying the joy now and maybe there'll be sorrow up the road sometime and you know, that'll have its time, but for now, I'm enjoying what I have. There's a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. So a time to select here, time to reject. This could refer to the process of gathering building materials that are suitable. The idea is that there are moments when we choose, for example, our career or our friends, our home, our partners, our, our marriage partners. And then there's a time to you know, reject what's before us. The point here, we don't have to go through every open door. You know, we often pray, Lord, please open a door of opportunity. Okay, you know, I've made that prayer. I've encouraged others to make that prayer. Please, Lord, open a door of opportunity, whatever that is. But you know, <laughs> did you understand that Satan could also open doors of opportunity? Have you ever thought about that? Not every open door of opportunity comes from God. You have to examine that opportunity. Opportunity for what? Oh, you got the opportunity to get a, a new job that pays 30% more. Only thing is you'll have to move to some obscure village in London or in, in, in England in order to get that job. Is that an open door of opportunity? Yes. Is it a godly opportunity? Wait a minute, there's no church there. I'm going to have to uproot my kids from school. Uh, I'm going to have to you know, just throw everything away that I've built here, take a loss on my house. I'm 42 years old, maybe I don't want to get, you know, you know, you know, I'm not 42, but I know you were thinking that, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not every open door is, a, is an opportunity. So there's a time to select, there's a time to walk through, and there's a time to say, eh, maybe not. Hmm. I should have I, I used this example. Last week, there's a brother in the Lord who called me from Edmonton. You know where Edmonton is? 
Edmonton in Canada, in Western Canada, Northern Western Canada. And uh, we were just talking about, the, they want me to go up there and just you know, preach a seminar, and so on and so forth. And then he said, brother, uh, we have an opening here for a, a pulpit minister. Would you be interested? Open door, opportunity. And I said, nah, thank you. You're very kind to think of me, you know, but I'm here in Choctaw, our family's here. We have a great ministry going. You know, it doesn't go down to 40 below zero for 10 months of the year, small matter, but. So not every, you know, not every open door is, some of them we have to say, we have to take a pass on. Sometimes you know, there's a time to consolidate and stand pat. And sometimes, you know, well, it's time to start over. We need to have wisdom to know which is which. Is which. There's a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. Some moments call for warm relationships, loving interaction. Others bring us into confrontation, rebuke conflict. Again, can't, you can't avoid these. There's a time for both. A time to search and a time to give up is lost. Pretty straightforward, a, time, a balance between the effectiveness and probability of success in a mission, a project, a search that needs to guide us in deciding to go on. And then there's also a time to work hard and push ahead. But as Solomon says, there's also a time to say, OK, this thing, this is not going to work. Or this is not worth the risk. Or there's no longer any chance of success. We need to give it up. Just recently in the news, you know, that flight that was missing, that plane that just went missing from, I think, Indonesia somewhere. Was that three years ago? How time flies? Three years now? They've officially said, we're not investing any more time or resources into the search for that missing jetliner. Pretty sure that all who are on board are lost. We're not going to try to find the black box. We're not going to try to find what happened because you know, the resources and manpower no longer uh, you know, uh, are worth the, what we're trying to find. Yeah, of course. And I, you know, I, funny, I read that and I didn't read any other articles that criticized them for having done this. Had they given up after three days? OK, come on. You know. But three years? I think, I think these people have you know, made a, a, a proper effort here. A time, a, time for, a time for both, isn't it? Um, a time to keep, a time to discard. Refers not only to the garage sale mentality, but also to our own ideas and circumstances. Paul says that you know, he put away childish things. And this also refers to the sorting out of what is valuable and what is useless in our lives, what we keep and what we discard, as far as ideas or habits. It's not just about things here. It could be about things, but it's not just about things. When we're younger, we have these ideas, what we're going to do. As we get older, we begin to examine these ideas with the, the hindsight of experience and understanding. We realize, hmm, that was, you know, I may, I may have to change my position on, on, that, on, that, on that issue. Grief and resolution, a time to tear apart, a time to sew together. Tearing apart could refer to the rending of clothing done to signify grief and mourning over the loss of loved one or the loss of dignity or health. You know, the, they would tear their clothing and put ash, uh, ashes and wear sackcloth as a, as a way to demonstrate. And then when he says uh, sewing together, the sewing, the sewing of the torn clothing at that time was also a sign that the period of grieving was over. So they rent their clothes to demonstrate their grief, and then there would be a period where they would sew that clothing back and put it back on. In life, we go through both stages, and as I mentioned before, uh, and we should, we should anticipate that. A time for, a time to be silent, a time to speak, silence and speaking out, legitimate times to voice our concerns, to stand up for what is right. Other times it's best and loving and prudent to remain quiet. And we ask God to give us the wisdom to know <laughs> when to speak and when not to. But there's a time for both. A time to love and a time to hate. 
In life we experience both times of friendship and love and warmth and also moments of injustice and oppression and prejudice which revile us and which we, which we hate. A time for both. I, I, I don't think here he's suggesting that there are times we love people and then there are other times it's okay to hate people. I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking this is uh, what he's suggesting. There's the time when we are loving something, someone, some movement, some idea. And then there are other times where we need to despise those things. We need to reject those things. We need to denounce those things. And then a time for war and a time for peace. Again, the cycle is seen and has always been seen in a never ending series of conflicts and wars, followed by a period of peace. These will continue until the end of time. The only difference in each life is the intensity and the duration of either period. That's the only difference. We've been so blessed in this country, although there have been foreign wars, there have been no wars that are fought on our, in our country. No open wars anyways. And that's a, great, that's a great blessing. The people of Europe can't say that. Many other nations can't say that. So we get to verse nine. He's gone through all of these 14. We get to verse nine and he says, what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? So what's his uh, conclusion? Well, he says, what's the profit? What advantage, what advantage is there in all of these experiences? So Solomon reviews the whole of man's experience in the context of time and he seeks to find out what all of these experiences mean or lead to. And the answer implied here is that there is no profit. <laughs> there is no point to it. The sum total of all of man's experiences measured in time, in the time of his life, amount to nothing more than a cycle of experiences common to all people. Everybody lives and dies. Everybody loves and hates. Everybody builds and, 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 and breaks down. Everybody experiences all of these things. It just keeps going round and round and round and round every generation. So it goes to the final conclusions in verse 10 and 11. He says, I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. So if there's no profit to the sum of man's experiences in time, then what's the point of it all? Well, the point that Solomon discovers can only be found beyond man's experience, beyond man's point of view, and see human experience in time within a divine context, not just a human context. In other words, time only makes sense when considered within an eternal framework. Solomon, looking at time within eternity, draws three main conclusions here. Number one, God has made everything appropriate or beautiful in its time. In other words, there is order in the seasons as well as in our lives. From the eternal perspective, every event and experience in time works for God's purpose and is appropriate because of that reason. Only when we see it from a time perspective is it chaotic or meaningless. But seen from the perspective of eternity, time finally takes on some sense of meaning. Next conclusion. God has put eternity into our hearts. In other words, man cannot accept his own finiteness and this is because he has been created in the image of an eternal being. Usually when we say created in the image of God, we usually are thinking of the fact that we are moral beings. God is pure and God is perfect and we're created in His image and so therefore we have a desire to be pure and perfect. But he's not talking about this. He's talking about the eternal nature of God. 
And the reason that we have this hunger is because we've been created in the image of an eternal being. So this vision of eternity is what fuels our curiosity about tomorrow, as well as what the distant stars are like. However, none of our discoveries about tomorrow or the universe can ever give meaning to the whole without reference to God. All the parts of life described when put together do not equal something meaningful. You have to add one other part which is outside of time. And so our yearning for eternity and eternal life can only be satisfied by discovering the person and the work and the salvation found in Jesus Christ, the only one who has been revealed to us that we have actually been able to see that has eternal life. This is why he says that he is, you know, Jesus says he is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We only understand eternity and its meaning when we accept Christ, the author of time. I read outside of Ecclesiastes here, Colossians. Paul says of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Third conclusion, we will never discover God's total work. Even though we have a sense of eternity built into our nature and God reveals through Jesus Christ His desire for us, and what is His desire for us? That we build something here, a building, a monument, a business, a reputation, is that His? No. God's desire for us is that we find salvation. But it doesn't stop there, His desire for us is that we resurrect from the dead. His desire for us is that we put on a glorified body, meaning a body suitable to live in the dimension where God is. Okay? And also, His desire for us is exaltation. Resurrection, glorification, exaltation. Exaltation to what? to the right hand of God with Jesus. What does that mean? It means we partake in the Godhead. I mean, I, I've said the words, I, but I can't get my brain around the idea. But that's what exaltation, that's what we've been called to. Exaltation to the right hand of God with Jesus. That's what Paul is talking about when the kingdom on earth is merged with the kingdom in heaven and it just snaps together and becomes one single unit. We've been called to that. So we're still less, so even though we understand this sense of eternity, we are still less than He is and we will always be less than Him. So in God's case, the sum of all the parts is less than the whole. We will never know all He has done. And this should immediately humble us and permit us to praise Him without, uh, without reservation forever. To God be the glory forever, amen. He is God and I am not. And I know we understand those words, but <laughs> when we truly understand them, that He is God and we are not, that's the beginning of insight into the godly nature. Okay, so some thoughts from Ecclesiastes. I think I heard a bell, so that's our class is over. Thank you for your attention.